today here to talk with us just after your plenary session uh, presentation. It was a great uh, presentation. It talked a lot about your field and the future of plant sciences. But I want to start with asking you about your background. How did you come to be a botanist? Well, I loved nature and plants since I was a small child. I can't remember when I didn't like uh, natural history. I was very fortunate to grow up out in a rural area in the highlands of Scotland to begin with and then later on in uh, the Cotswolds in England. So there were plants, birds, animals all around me. I had two aunts who were very keen amateur botanists and they were delighted in my interest and started teaching me how to identify plants and they used the Latin names not just the common names and then I was fortunate to go to school uh, and be in the house of the biology master and he took those students that were interested in natural history out looking for plants and animals collecting insects so I had a great time and I think from when I was about 11 I wanted to be a botanist and what I've done really is made my hobby my job which is one of the most satisfying things one can do in life I think. When did you first start traveling and exploring as part of your botany? Well my early times as a teenager the exploration was all in Britain and nearby in Europe trip to the Swiss Alps and things like that when I went to Oxford University, uh, at the end of my undergraduate time, I organized an undergraduate expedition to Turkey to collect plants. So that was really my first true botanical fieldwork, a four-month expedition in western Turkey. And I went with uh, five other students and one other botanist. And we had a great time, collected a lot of plants and made a useful contribution to what they were then writing, uh, Flora, about the plants of Turkey. I think that your passion seems to be tropical botany. When was your first trip to the tropics and where did you go and what's the most spectacular tropical rainforest you've ever worked in? Well, my passion is tropical botany and uh, I changed that gradually. After the trip to Turkey, I was thinking of doing a PhD on the Turkish flora. But uh, as an undergraduate, I'd done some work in a lab in tropical botany in the herbarium in Oxford. And one of the botanists there asked me, would I not rather do a PhD with him in tropical botany? And I thought, well, that sounds even more exotic and diverse. And uh, I was interested in the field and exploration, and that's what I really wanted to do. So I said yes and started working on uh, specimens in Oxford and in other herbaria to start with, getting people to send seeds so I could grow them in a greenhouse. And then uh, at the end of my PhD work, after three years, I went on an expedition to Suriname in uh, northern South America and spent four months on an expedition to the Wilhelmina Mountains in Suriname. And that was really my first tropical experience. And the forest there is magnificent. We were right in the interior of Suriname. So I fell in love with the tropical rainforest and I've gone back to the tropical rainforest every single year since 1963, which was my first expedition. So I've really been going to the tropical rainforest for nearly 40 years now. Your own specialty in botany is of Brazil nuts? My specialty in botany in the early days was a plant family called the Chrysobalanaceae. That's the one I did my thesis on and did a lot of my early research. And as I began to do that and uh, was completing work, I was looking for another plant family to work on. And so uh, I saw the Brazil nuts, which have rather large, attractive flowers. And it's a very common plant family in the Amazon and thought this would be fun to work with. And so I started work on uh, the Brazil nuts and became one of the two world experts on the Brazil nut family. In every great scientific career, there's a moment when personal research turns more toward uh, research that guides institutions or looks at wider, uh, wider questions. What is the turning point in your research? There were various turning points in my research, but I, I think the first one was that I had been going to the Amazon for a long time and started a good relationship with a local institute called the National Amazon Research Institute. 
And uh, one evening, uh, we went to drinks with the director, and the director there was moaning. He said, two more students that I've trained have uh, decided not to come back to the Institute, even though they signed a promise to do so. One has stayed in the United States, where he did his PhD. The other one, instead of coming to Manaus and the Amazon, has gone to settle in Rio de Janeiro. And I said, Dr. Paula, what you really need to do is to set up a graduate program here in the Amazon and get the students excited, so excited with the Amazon environment that they won't want to leave the region. And he said to me that evening, the head of the research council is coming to Manaus on his way back from Miami the next day. Would you write a, a, a program for me on a graduate program? So I spent all night doing that did it, and the next day he summoned me to his office and said, your program is funded. I said, what, mine? It's yours. He said, no, you're going to direct it. And I said, well, I, direct, I work for the New York Botanical Garden. He said, well, I'll go and tell your director that I need you. And he went up there and uh, saw the director of the New York Botanical Garden and said, I need Ian France for two years on leave to set up a graduate program for me. And he was convincing and managed to... Uh, uh, get me to have a leave of absence. So I started there in administration in a small way, teaching that I had to set up everything for this, the first graduate program in the Amazon. So I did that, it was very successful, and we trained about uh, 14 master students that first time. And then I was going back to New York, and the director of research at New York Botanical Garden had resigned. And to my surprise, when I got there, they, uh, they asked me to become director of research. And then I gradually went up the administrative ladder to be in charge of all the science at New York Botanical Garden, and then ultimately to be director of the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew in London, which is uh, the world's greatest botanic garden. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just going to no, we, we're going to door close. Just the beginning, just the beginning, just just the very beginning. It may not affect anything, but for the editors, they may need to clean it up. What, 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 what was the beginning about? <laughs> <laughs> the intro to your question. Okay. In every scientific career, there's a turning point where someone leaves off doing just their individual work and starts to guide larger programs or larger institutions. What was the turning point in your career? Well, there have been various turning points in my career, but really the first one was when I was in Manaus, Brazil, working with the National Amazon Research Institute. And one evening I went to the director's house for a drink, and he started moaning and said, oh dear, two more scientists have not come back, and I paid for them. And uh, one has stayed in the United States, and the other one has gone to Rio de Janeiro, instead of staying in the Amazon region in Manaus. So I said to him, Dr. Paolo, what you need is to set up a graduate program here in the Amazon. The students will get so enthusiastic about the forest that they will never, ever want to leave. And uh, so uh, I think that uh, probably gives you the first part roughly the same. <laughs> For a British subject, being the head of Q must be an unusual honor. Tell us about Kew and its role in Britain. Kew is a very famous botanic garden in Britain and worldwide. It began as a royal garden. The mother of King George III, Princess Augusta, began to bring a botanical collection to the royal gardens at a place called Kew. And uh, then afterwards, when George III came to the throne, he lived there at times. And he hired Sir Joseph Banks, who was the uh, uh, botanist on Captain Cook's second expedition. And Sir Joseph Banks was horticultural advisor to George III. And George III's aim was to get the greatest collection of plants in Europe there at Kew. He built greenhouses, which they called stoves in those days. And uh, they did get an absolutely remarkable collection, particularly of Australian and South African plants. And then in, in 1820, George III and Sir Joseph Banks died in the same year, and the collection at Kew sort of went downhill. But in 1840, the Parliament was persuaded to uh, give it to the nation and found a botanic garden. And so then 
it was built up. They called in a professor from Glasgow University called Sir William Hooker, and he was the first director of Kew, and it went from strength to strength. Initially, it was very much to service the needs of the British Empire, and so moving plants around the world from one part of the empire to another, uh, but always it had a very strong research component. And so botanical research uh, has uh, been what Q is, be, uh, is about. And in the course of this, it's built up a fantastic collection. There are 33,000 species of plants growing at Kew today. And it is a wonderful combination of education, horticulture, and research and I think is uh, leading the world in what botanic gardens should be doing. And today, with the loss of vegetation around the world, one of the most important things that Kew is involved with is the conservation of biological diversity. And more and more, the research we do, the field activities are geared on saving plants before we lose them all. During your tenure at Kew, you moved this institution into the 21st century. It seems that you've used a lot of innovative techniques. Uh, can you tell us about some of your plans for using these historic collections to make decisions in the future? Yes, I, I think that is exactly what I did. I found a rather sleepy institution that uh, was, uh, yes, probably in the last century before last, and it was a great challenge to move the institution forward. One of the things I think that was most important for the Institute in the 1990s was that we set up a molecular systematics laboratory where we started looking at plant DNA and using that for classification. And so that has enhanced our ability to produce predictive classifications. And that is not only good for the theory of plant systematics, it is also vital for conservation because we have a much better idea of relationships. The molecular lab can do fingerprinting, and when you've got a small population of a plant, what you can do is look at the ten or five individuals you've got left and see which is the most closely related and which are most distant, and so make the breeding across the biggest genetic distance you've got and get stronger progeny. Then another thing that uh, I did at Kew, seeing how plants are being lost, was expanded our seed banking operation from being a very small uh, preservation of seeds to something that we called the Millennium Seed Bank to celebrate the entry into this new millennium, uh, 2000. And uh, our goal there is to collect and preserve the seeds of 10% of the total world flora by the year 2010. And I think that's a truly millennial project because what it's doing is making those seeds uh, available in 100, in 200 years. And so if plants go extinct, we will have them. And we know that will happen because uh, already Kew's been banking seeds for 25 years. And there are two species in the seed bank within the British flora that have gone extinct in the world. And uh, they haven't gone extinct, literally, only in the wild, because we've got the seeds, and uh, we are propagating them and reintroducing them. Those are some of the things I have uh, done at Kew, but then using my own scientific data and encouraging the other taxonomists to use it to plan where you put forest reserves, to plan what are the key areas for conservation, etc., is another part of the work. And then education of the public, so that we alert public awareness to what is happening, and that plants are important, that people depend on plants. So uh, exhibitions and education programs have increased vastly at Kew during my 11-year tenure as director. One of the things that you said in your talk was you use the phrase, the importance of plants to people. How can we take this message to people that plants are important? We've got to take the message that the plants uh, are vitally important to people because uh, we depend on plants. Plants are the only organisms that take the uh, basic elements from the atmosphere and uh, turn it into something that uh, life can use, photosynthesis is done by plants, that is fixing the, uh, the, the carbon dioxide and water together to produce sugars. And all the rest of animal life depends on plants in some way. We use plants for our clothing, for our food, 
for our shelter, in, for our medicines, in so many different ways. So plants are vital. If there weren't plants, there wouldn't be people or other animals. And what we're doing as we lose plant species is we're narrowing our options for the future. Are we losing a cure for AIDS? Are we losing a vital new source of nutrition for people? Uh, are we losing a plant that will produce uh, some artificial fiber from it? Uh, energy plants, all sorts of different things. So we need to keep those plants. And so plants and people is a theme of uh, both an exhibition currently at Kew and a new project I just got involved with in the southwest of England in the county of Cornwall called the Eden Project, whose whole goal is to interpret plants and people and sustainable use of the environment. In the Eden Project, as I understand it, you'll try to recreate a tropical rainforest in the English countryside? We are going to create five acres of rainforest in the English countryside. It's actually in a disused clay pit where they mined China clay for many years. And so it will be a dome up against the side of the clay pit with the background being a cliff of white clay. And it, the rainforest will cover five acres, and then a Mediterranean forest will cover one and a half acres. And it will be opening to the public in June 2001. And the whole idea will be uh, to have the rainforest there, but to interpret the use of the plants. There will be three areas in the rainforest, one for the American rainforest, one for Africa, and one for Asia. And in each will be a little hut with local plants that the people would grow there so that we show how rainforest plants are vital. But what is interesting is how many rainforest plants do we depend upon here so far from the uh, rainforest? We drive on rubber tires and uh, we drink coffee and we uh, eat bananas and we, we have uh, medicines to cure malaria and many other diseases that have come from the rainforest. And so we can get a wonderful message over of uh, plants from all over the world are really feeding into the economies of any country where you might be. Over the past century, we've seen lots of changes in science. In the plant science, what do you think was the most significant development? It's very hard to say what is the most uh, significant development in plant sciences over the past century, but I would uh, say it must be the breaking of the genetic code that uh, understanding DNA in the first place and then uh, applying the molecular techniques in uh, plant science, both uh, in classification, in uh, population studies, and uh, in uh, understanding for breeding programs. So uh, molecular work probably has been the most uh, startling and exciting uh, development in the last century. Presently, we have many challenges facing us. What do you see for the future of your science? Well, the biggest challenge facing biologists today is to preserve biology, to preserve the species and the habitats so that there is a future for biologists to study, a future for the human race to go on living. And I think biologists have got to get together much more united and put pressure on governments because there isn't yet the political will to really do something about stopping the destruction of natural habitats. And uh, we have been effective in giving some of the theory and areas that should be preserved. In, but we've not really been effective in getting that message over politically in either the developed world or the developing world. And so we've got to present a united front to do that. I want to thank you, sir, Ian, for your time with us. It was a wonderful interview. Thank you. It's very nice to have been with you today. Thank you for interviewing me.